chance that you have, quicken with stagey punctuation, with dots and hyphens and exclamation marks in Tom Wolfe's The Bonfire of the Vanities. In the two years since the novel was published, Wolfe's idea of the bonfire, of the city engulfed in flames of greed and racial hatred, has passed from fact into fiction and back again. Wolfe's incendiary black preacher, Reverend Bacon, seems to have been modelled on Al Sharpton, but it might just as easily have been Sharpton who got the inspiration for himself from Bacon. A door opened and a tall black man entered the room, looking like ten million dollars. He wore a black suit, tailored in a way that brought out the width of his shoulders and the trimness of his waist. The jacket had a two-button roll that revealed a gorgeous acre of white shirt front. The starched collar was immaculate against the man's dark skin. He wore a necktie with a black crisscross pattern, the sort of necktie that Anwar Sadat used to wear. Kramer felt rumpled just looking at him. The man walked towards him, held out his hand, and said, Reginald Bacon. The frequency with which we now invoke the novel's title to name events, this seems to come straight out of the bonfire of the vanities, we say, tells us more about its remarkable timeliness than do the usual gauges of success. How many weeks on the bestseller list? 56 in America, 36 here. How major the major motion picture? Major, major. And how big the advance? Seven million dollars, rumor has it, for whatever Wolf has a fancy for writing next. For Wolf himself, the book's success is a vindication of the argument he has been propounding for a quarter of a century, that there are fat novels of social realism screaming to be written about the here and now of American urban life, but that no American novelist has the stomach to write them, the American novel having decided that its only business is with itself, with introspection, and with what university intellectuals like to call ideas. As fast as I could possibly do it, I was turning out articles on this amazing spectacle that I saw bubbling and screaming right there in front of my wondering eyes, New York. And all the while, I just knew that some enterprising novelist was going to come along and do this whole marvelous scene with one gigantic, daring, bold stroke. It was so ready, so ripe, beckoning. But it never happened. Novelists seem to shy away from the life of the great cities altogether. The thought of tackling such a subject seemed to terrify them. It didn't terrify him, Wolf would have us understand. In article after article, book after book, he delighted in rubbing fiction writers' noses in what they were missing. And along the way, he helped to develop what came to be known as the new journalism. New primarily in that it was a rejection of the big amoeba god of Anglo-European sophistication in favour of the whole crazed, obscene, uproarious, mammon-faced, drug-soaked, mau-mau, lust-oozing 60s America. With one wicked phrase, the radical chic, he did for New York's liberal intelligentsia. With the right stuff, he made hero worship, the wrong kind of hero worship, right again. From the start, it was unselfconscious, tasteless, blue-collar America he championed. Coming up from the rear in lane two, it's a white 1969 Pontiac Bonneville two-door. We're now making its bid in lane four, a future debut, a 1970 Mercury Cougar. And coming up from the left from the in offer and babbling down, it's a wreck cheek raspberry 1970 Rabies hardtop 400 on the freeways of Los Angeles. But not exactly what the utopian thinkers of the 19th century had in mind when they foresaw the day when the average worker daddy would have the time and the money to extend his ego in any direction on his own terms. But what we have here is more than mere stylistics. Tom Wolfe's historical significance is this. Noticing that good old boy white Protestant America had its fingers in its ears about the time he passed by, what with the Jewish novelists wise cracking and apocalypse mongering on one side of the street and the black writers rapping and prognosticating on the other, he invented a form which broke their monopoly on street smart prose, which offered an alternative to the high seriousness of Jewish immigrant writing and which borrowed black vitality, freed from its context of grievance and guilt, for the purposes of a sort of all-white prose cabaret. In Tom Wolfe's new journalism, wasp culture recovered its self-respect. New journalism, though, was still only journalism, whatever the grandiosity of Wolfe's claims for it. And anyone with a shrewd eye on the itch that Wolfe could never stop rubbing, the novel, the novelist, the prestige still accorded to both, after all he had done to dethrone them, 
anyone could have spotted that Woolf would never rest until he had bested the novelists on their own territory. On the surface at least, the bonfire of the vanities answers all Woolf's soul demands of a novel. That it should take on the bubbling and screaming of the urban spectacle. That it should address the question of how we live now realistically in the manner of his heroes Balzac and Zola and Dickens. That it should have the virtues of the best journalism, knowing whereof it speaks. That it should confront the most burning contemporary issues, however divisive. Not the state of the novel, not the angst of the novelist, but the big issues of power, envy, race, and above all, money. If you weren't making $250,000 a year within your first five years on Wall Street, then you were either grossly stupid or grossly lazy. That was the word. By age 30, $500,000, and that sum had the taint of the mediocre. By 40, you were either making a million a year or you were timid and incompetent. Make it now! That motto burned in every heart like myocarditis. Boys on Wall Street, mere boys with smooth jawlines and clean arteries, boys still able to blush, were buying $3 million apart on Park and Fifth. Why wait? The bonfire of the vanities tells the story of Sherman McCoy, a bond dealer going broke on $980,000 a year, but still sufficiently conscious of his good fortune, his connections, his apartment on Park Avenue, to think of himself as a master of the universe. All this is destroyed by his presence in the wrong part of town, in the wrong car, with the wrong woman beside him, at the scene of an accident where the wrong colour of kid is knocked down and killed. Everything is taken from McCoy. Family, job, status, money. On his downward spiral through the New York society most bond dealers do not expect ever to confront, he encounters Judge Kovitsky, Jewish warrior, who administers justice in the Bronx for only $65,000 a year, and Kramer, the assistant district attorney, lured by lust and envy, especially lust, especially envy, into abandoning the straight and ill-rewarded paths of legal virtue. And above all, there's Killian, the lawyer with the wrong accent and the too sharp clothes, who can handle himself as well in the streets as in the courts. So is this the definitive moral fable of the definitive modern city? Are we as convinced by Wolf the novelist as we were by Wolf the journalist? Do we accept his vision of the way things are? Joining me in one of the less extravagant rooms in Sherman McCoy's apartment are a number of people who might not be invited there in the normal course of events. Christopher Hitchens lives in Washington and writes for a daunting number of periodicals both here and in America. He's reviewed Wolf's work many times over the years, not always uncritically. Rhoda Koenig has crossed the Atlantic in the opposite direction. She now lives in London but continues to review books for New York magazine. Homi Babur lectures in English literature at the University of Sussex and has a particular interest in the way black people are portrayed in white literature. Ed Hayes is a successful attorney with more than a passing resemblance to the character of Thomas Killian. Wolfe dedicates the book to Councillor Hayes, who walked among the flames, pointing at the lurid lights. But then New York has always been Ed Hayes' home. The thing about it is you have to understand, above all else, since I was born in New York City and I've been raised in New York City, New York City is not America. New York City is utterly unreflective of America in terms of its population makeup. It's unreflective of America in terms of its history. New York City has always been an immigrant city. It's always been a minority city. It's always been a city where you get ahead by, by struggle and blood, and it's still that way. And it, the me it seems to me that to not look at the book within the historical context of New York City is as silly as if you try to, di to discuss current English politics without looking at it that within a historical English con context. So the vanities that the bonfire is under are New York vanities? I think so. And, and also I think that the, the essential vanity that he talks about is the fact that Sherman McCoy is there on Park Avenue thinking that his life will go on as it <laughs> went for his father and for, for his background, which is an almost non-existent one in New York, which is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, wealthy person, will go on as it is. What's the pressure on this then? What is the actual, what's threatening Sherman McCoy's lifestyle? What's, what's threatening Sherman McCoy 